Wonderful to be together again this morning. Great hearing about Celebrate Recovery. Great, great actually hearing them refer to the Sermon on the Mount because we're going to touch that a bit this morning. But my job this morning is to really help us land this well-being series. So thanks for being with us and hopefully God's really going to speak this morning, okay? My opening question is this. What have you done with all the things that we've been talking about and sharing about with regard to well-being in the last few weeks? What have you done with it? Here's a scripture that we're going to really land on today, uh, and it's from Matthew 27, 24 to 29. It says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." When Jesus had finished finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. And I imagine, like, if he'd he'd done that in the 21st century, that was a mic drop moment for Jesus, and he'd have turned and gone. Pretty powerful stuff. Jesus says, hear these words of mine and put them into practice. Hear them put them into practice. And that's what Jesus is all about. In fact, that's what being a disciple, a follower of Jesus is all about. And if we want to be true followers of Jesus ourselves, then that's what we will want to be all about. Can I hear a yes and amen? I think I can hear you from home. And so I'm encouraged. So well-being, well-being, we've been talking about it for the last few weeks. It's about the shalom of God. It's about defining and finding that peace of God through building life around him in every area of life. And we've looked at spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, physical well-being, financial well-being, relational well-being, and indeed vocational well-being in the last few weeks. And as we land this, I really want to help us this morning to look at it through the, the lens of discipleship. What have you done with it? How have you taken the words of Jesus and put them into practice? And I wanted the Sermon on the Mount just to really help us with that a bit. Now, I'm not going to unpack the whole Sermon on the Mount, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, But if you're interested in that, you can still sign up for Deeper, by the way. There's a plug for that. Go to our website, and tonight you can pick it up, um, a fantastic teaching series that we're doing online together. And that's, that's actually all around the Sermon on the Mount at the moment. But the context of these verses that we've just read about the wise and foolish builders, are actually Jesus' concluding words to the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. And over the course of three chapters in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus unpacks all kinds of discipleship-oriented teaching to the crowds. And then he lands it with this powerful statement, build your house upon the rock, not upon the sand. Take my words and apply them to your life. He isn't just trying in his teaching and in his journey with these guys to give them intellectual knowledge, to give them more information. But somehow he's trying to give them guidance about what it looks like to actually live as the children of God with with the Spirit of God at the very center. And his concluding words to it all, don't just hear it, don't go away and debate it simply, don't just go away and critique it, don't go away and forget about it. Go away and do it. And everyone who hears his words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his home upon the rock. Now, it's interesting because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus isn't actually teaching a well-being series, but just as an observation, he does touch a lot of these topics along the way. Think about spiritual well-being. He says, and this is how you should pray as he teaches. And we'll think about emotional well-being. He talks a lot about worry and finding peace amongst emotional distress, physical well-being. He says, this is how you should fast. And he talks about the body. Financial well-being. Do not store your treasures on earth, but in heaven. Relational well-being. Don't judge. Don't commit adultery. Don't break your oaths. Love your enemies. And even vocational well-being. Make, make God your pursuit, not money. These 
topics are rock-like topics that we've been looking at in the last few weeks that Jesus wants us to build into our lives. There's no sand here, folks, if we want to be disciples. We need to be putting not just a learning in place in our kind of minds intellectually, but actually a practice of the ways and works of Jesus as well in terms of how we might live. And the whole of the Sermon on the Mount is to be understood in that context. It's actually, uh, it actually gives us a good picture of the pattern of Jesus' teaching full stop, not just in, the, in this sermon. He taught in very practical ways, and he wrestled things out with the disciples and those that followed him. Uh, and those that truly wanted to be disciples, they stuck with him and they put those things into his life. Those, those who didn't, they fell away as time went by. Think of the rich young ruler who couldn't quite bring himself to apply the teaching of Jesus into his life. So let's read that again. Just Matthew 27, sorry, Matthew 7, 24 to 29. Therefore, everyone who hears hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Just let God speak to you about the last few weeks as you hear these words. The rain came down, The streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. All kinds of things came that might shake it. And yet, it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. The rock being hearing the words of Jesus and applying them to life. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, says Jesus, is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, he dropped the mic, and the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one with authority, not as their teachers of the law. Jesus' pattern, teach, walk with people, and then apply. So I ask you again, lovingly, loving challenge this morning, how are we applying these well-being principles into our lives? You know, when Jesus was teaching this stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, and, and actually much of his entire journey that we see through the Gospels, he absolutely had the Pharisees in his sights. The Pharisees were those who were obsessed with legalism and the law, but not just the law as God had meant it in its most simplistic way, but actually a whole multitude of other laws that had been added by man. And they were more concerned with ticking boxes and wrestling things out intellectually than they ever were with actually applying the ways, works, and words of God into their lives. They had a haughty spirit and were in danger of those who Jesus was ta- of being those who Jesus was talking about in the few verses just before this passage about being wise and foolish builders in the same sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, you know, the day's going to come when many of you come before me and you say that I've been calling and praying in your name and I'll say, get away from me because I never knew you. Why? Because this haughty spirit, this pharisaical spirit, actually wasn't rooted in genuine relationship worked out by applying the principles of discipleship and putting things actually into place in life, building on the rock. Let's not be like these Pharisees. Jesus was literally warring against that pharisaical spirit all the time. Let's not be like them. Now, we see this elsewhere, lots of places actually in Jesus' ministry, but in one particular place, it always catches my attention. I love these verses. It's in John chapter 8. We see Jesus, he's walking and journeying with uh, actually the crowds. And in amongst the crowds, there's some who are being persuaded by him and are trying to shape their life around him to build the house on a rock. And there's these Pharisees at the same time who just want to be argumentative and they're not actually looking to apply it in the same way. And they're asking, who are the children of God then? And Jesus says this in John 8, 32 and 33. He says, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Just look at the order of that. If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Guys, this whole idea of well-being and The fullness of God in every area of life is absolutely about knowing the truth and the truth 
setting us free. That's where that shalom comes from, that sense of peace, because we're free. But it comes about, first and foremost, by holding to Jesus' teachings. That means taking hold of them and actually applying them into life. And if you hold to my teachings, says Jesus, then you are my disciples. Then you are really my disciples. I think often we can have it the other way around. We can put a label on ourselves, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Okay, now I'm a disciple of Jesus. Uh, In theory, then, I can kind of do what I like. I don't actually have to do anything with it. But Jesus says, actually, the only marker of being a real disciple is applying my teachings into your life in the first place. What's that looking like for us? How are we applying these things into our lives? How are we stepping into true discipleship? I've said it many times before, my favorite simple definition from Dallas Willard, discipleship, living life as Jesus would if he walked in your shoes. If Jesus lived your life today, he was plugged into your family, your vocation, with your finances and your relationships, how would Jesus work that out? That's the call, to work that out and to live it in the way that he would. My, my honest perspective is that this series actually has a lot of spiritual warfare going on around it because of this issue. Because the last thing our enemy, the devil, Satan, the last thing he wants us to do is become more like Jesus. In fact, he wants to separate us from God, from Jesus. He wants to separate us from each other. He wants to isolate and accuse us. He's after our souls. He's out to destroy us. And he does that by taking away our peace. If well-being and shalom is is defined as being finding the peace of God in all areas of life, then destroying our peace and keeping us away from God and from growing is his number one priorities. He wants us to dismiss all of these things. He wants us to take hold of these well-being things and think like Pharisees. Are we going to think like Pharisees or are we going to think like disciples of Jesus? I don't know how many sermons and messages and talks you, you've sat through in your life. More than a few, right? <laughs> uh, and all the things you've heard, some of them great, some of them decidedly average. How many can you remember? And how much of all that teaching has actually been applied in your life? I know if I look at my life, I can say I've sat through more than my fair share of teaching. And if I think about it honestly, uh, and I ask myself the question, how much have I applied into my life over many, many years of what I've been taught? I think I come up a bit short. If I'd taken hold of everything that's been sown into my life and walked it through with Jesus at the center, I'd be much more like Jesus now than I am today. I've discussed it, I've critiqued it, I've debated it, I've critiqued the preacher, I've pointed out what was missing and not said or wrong in my opinion. I've reacted to what's challenged me. Have I applied it to my life? Not so much as I wish I had historically. What about you guys? I want to be applying the principles that we see in Jesus into my life every day. And so the challenge, you know, the challenges are many. You know, nothing's perfect, is it? We can say there's not enough scripture in that message or I didn't like that illustration or they didn't mention this or they didn't mention that. I'm afraid that's the things though, guys, that, that Jesus was warring against with the Pharisees of his day. It's not that we shouldn't apply our brains, but we should guard our hearts and apply the principles. So what's the leading edge for us? Is it a heart and a desire to be more like Jesus? And is it a discipling spirit? So, All that said, let's just land again on these key areas that we've looked at in this series around well-being. And I want to encourage you to have a spirit that's open, a heart that's open right now, just to be saying, Lord Jesus, what is it that you really want me to apply in the coming weeks? And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to put his finger on things, even now, very different things for different ones of us. And the challenge, the godly challenge is to say, How am I going to build my house on the rock with these things? So we talked about spiritual well-being. What's it look like for us to build our lives by putting our relationship with God right at the very center 
of everything we do. Putting him first. How's that going? What about emotional well-being? Recognizing that our emotions are real and they're valid. Learning to be informed by them and not led by them. Learning to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and knowing our true selves, not the false self that the enemy wants to put on us. And understanding our identity as designed and loved by God. How's that going? What's Jesus saying about that? What about physical well-being? Your body's a gift. Your body, my body, is, the, is a temple for the Holy Spirit. It's designed to be treasured and looked after. It matters. What's Jesus saying? How's that going? How about financial well-being? All that we have is a gift from God. And honoring him means stewarding it well and giving him our first and our best by faith. What's he saying to us about that? How's that going? Relational well-being. You were designed by a God who is and of himself community, Father, Son, and Spirit, living as one in relationship. We need healthy relationships. We're designed for them with him, with Father, Son, and Spirit, and with each other. It's part of his design. It takes work and attention to get that right. And the enemy, as I've just said, wants to separate us from one another, isolate, accuse, and bring us down. Let's not let him. That requires intentionality. How's that going? And what about vocational well-being? You were designed to work and find pleasure in it and balance in it between rest and work. You were designed to flow out of that restful place with your spiritual well-being into a vocational well-being. There is a unique design and call around your life. It takes work again and intention, but there is something unique that you bring to the table that God wants to draw out. What is it? And how is it going? What does stepping into the shalom of God look like for you in each and every area of your life? So here's my appeal, just as we end this short time together. Let's take hold together of what it means to build our house upon the rock. To not just hear words, but to look for the essence of what Jesus is saying and answer the question, what am I going to do about it? These two questions are simplistic and at the very center of discipleship. What's Jesus saying to me and what am I going to do about it? And I encourage you to take those questions away this week. I encourage you to not just take them away and think about them, but the, because the, the key to actually applying them into our life is to walk alongside others with them. If you feel like you're lonely, let us know. We can try and connect you with others. But perhaps there is someone else, whether it's in your family, in your community, that you can open yourself up to and to allow some degree of healthy accountability to come in, to say, these are the things that Jesus is saying, and this is a journey I want to go on with it. Will you help me to be a disciple of Jesus? And together, if we're asking each other these questions all the time, we will begin to succeed in having a culture of discipleship, a culture of becoming those who work out what it looks like to live how Jesus would if he walked in our shoes in this church. And we will increasingly step into that place of well-being that God has designed and got for us because he loves us. So be blessed with that. Go after it and look after one another as we together look to shape our lives with Jesus at the center. Amen. God bless you.